Okay, hello all, and welcome to a special Sunday Shiur at the Chabura. Tonight we have the pleasure of having Rabbi Francis Nataf with us, and we will be exploring the role of community in the formulation of halakha. Um, about our speaker, Rabbi Francis Nataf, is research and translation specialist at Sefaria, Tanakh instructor at Midrashat Rechel Lechaya, and associate editor of the Jewish Bible Quarterly. He's the author of Redeeming Relevance in the Torah series and of many articles on comparative religious thought, biblical studies, and education. Uh, in Chabura News, our publishing house has come out with our Shavuot book, which I highly recommend all uh, to, to get before the, uh, the Moed. And, uh, with that, uh, thank you all for uh, being here right now, and thank you all for uh, watching afterwards. And thank you so much, Rabbi, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Zoom is uh, it's a mixed blessing. Uh, I, I miss your personal energy, but I enjoy the fact that we can be sharing this Torah all around the world. It's, it's really a, a tremendous blessing that we can connect with like-minded people and uh, you know get to the right target audience and not just who's in the in the neighborhood. And I understand people are connecting from uh, at least two continents, if not three. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I have a, a lot to share, and I, I believe, you know, I try to keep within time limits. I believe I have another 55 minutes, if that's correct. Um, so I will get right into the sources. And as uh, as we said, the, the discussion topic is about the role of the people, specifically the Jewish people as a community in the formulation of halacha, but not just stopping there, also in the formulation of what's called hashkafa, of Jewish thought, of uh, Jewish thinking and philosophy. So we're going to speak about this topic. It's a it's a, a topic that really deserves much more than than an hour, but we'll at least uh, hit what's called in Hebrew the rashi prakim, the head ideas, the main ideas of of this topic. So there's an amazing source that's at the bottom of this that really sort of uh, creates the impetus, or at least um, is it brings a phrase that has resonated with many rabbis from the time of the Talmud. This phrase and the story is found in Psachim. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we go, share screen, okay, and here we go, okay, um, you're welcome to look at, uh, at your uh, source sheet as well, if it's easier for you, as, as we said before, it's, uh, it's linked, and I will also ask if anybody has a question, if it's a, you know, very important question, you feel, so then please tell us what that question is. If it's not, please write it on the chat, and I will do my best to, to take a look at what's going on in the chat. Um, so, in any case, the, the Gemara Sachim that you see in front of you is a discussion of Hillel. We all know Hillel, we've all heard of him, great rabbi in the Mishnaic period, in the period, the early rabbinic period, and he, at the beginning of his career, immigrated from Babylonia to the land of Israel. He was less well known. And this is uh, this particular scene is a scene when his greatness is really discovered. I mean, he had studied with uh, it, it, within the uh, Israeli academies already, but people didn't realize his greatness, how much he had learned, what his abilities were. In any case, preceding this section of the Gemara, so he's able to out uh, out gun to to show that he knew more and he understood the halakha better than other great scholars and at that point they decided well since you know so much perhaps you should be the leader the rabbinic leader what's called the nasi and uh, the the gemara is 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 fantastic and this always presents ironic i should say always but many times presents certain ironic twists and at this point where his his greatness was showing um, so he, they asked him, they, they were so impressed with him, and, and, the, and the issue is that he was also impressed with himself. Um, so the, the Gemara feels that, uh, that, you know, approves of the story because they feel this was somewhat ethically out of place. In any case, I'm reading in the Hebrew, the English is on top. Uh, it's a 
discussion of halakha, the halakha of uh, using a, a knife, obviously, for the shechita, for slaughtering the korban Pesach. Uh, the question is, can you bring that knife on Shabbat, right? Um, so, meaning that the, the, there's a need to slaughter the sacrifice on Shabbat. That's clear, that's permissible. But what about the transportation of the knife if the knife is not there? That's the question they were asking him, right? They forgot to bring the knife from the previous day. That would be the ideal. What's the halacha? So Amalein, halacha zo shamati v'shachachdi. So he admitted, oh, I also don't know everything. I actually knew once this halacha, but now I forgot it. Ele, and this is what we're really interested in. It's not the halachic discussion, but what follows. He says, but leave it to the Jews. If they're not prophets, they're the children of prophets. <clears throat> Meaning they must know. They must know what they would, would need to do. This certainly must have happened once before that the calendar came out. Don't forget the calendar in their time was undetermined, right? So therefore, in theory, uh, Erev, uh, Erev Pesach, the 14th of Nisan, in theory, never happened on a Shabbat. But in all probability, it did happen at some point, maybe several times. Hillel doesn't remember in his memory that he was in the land of Israel and saw this happening. Uh, so he trusts that the Jews have some sort of memory, collective memory, they would know the halacha. So in any case, in fact, that's exactly what happened. Right? Everybody found a way for the animal to carry the knife on their bodies, right? So this is the way they did it, avoiding the problem of humans, of Jews carrying on Shabbat, um, and finding a way nonetheless to allow for the Jews to continue with uh, the, as you know, the Koban, Koban uh, Pesach was uh, thousands and thousands of animals being slaughtered. So you needed a lot of knives and uh, it, would, it would not be sufficient for, for there not to be enough knives. And anyway, in any case, the Jews knew what to do. They brought all their knives in this, uh, in this uh, interesting fashion. And uh, he's, uh, he saw there he saw what everybody was doing in the sky, he remembered the halacha. This is what I learned also from my teachers. This is exactly what you're supposed to do, just like what the Jews did. Okay. Now, this phrase, you know, could really mean a lot of things. And, and ultimately, if it was just this Gemara, if it was not developed in the Jewish tradition, one could say that Hillel was just being poetic. Um, there is such a possibility. He wasn't saying anything beyond that and saying, essentially, I'm crowdsourcing it, right? Memory is not the same thing as knowledge. And I'm simply relying on, on collective memories. There, there are a lot of people out there. They don't need to be Talmud Chamim. They don't need to be sages. They don't need to be rabbis. Let's, let's see, you know, there's a thousand people in this town. Uh, let's see if anybody remembers what it is. And, the, and in fact, that's what they did. And afterwards, Hillel said, yeah, that's correct. That's what I remember as well now that, I, now that I've seen it, now that my memory has been jogged. Um, quick uh, interpretation is not the only interpretation of this, but I think it's in line with how it would be understood subsequently. Um, this is a, a, a very recent commentary, but I, th I think it, it presents it in a, in a nice way that, that summarizes, again, a position that's, that's not unique to um, Rav Yosef Chaim, who's the author of the Ben Yehoiada, more famous as the Ben Yishchai. Um, so his commentary is, is this Ben Yehoiada actually has two commentaries on the Agadot, on the story, the narrative sections of the Talmud. And very interesting commentary, a lot of very uh, creative understandings. Some are connected to Kabbalah, others are not. But given that so few rabbis have written extensively on uh, this section of uh, these sections of Talmud of Agadot, it's a good resource to know about. In any case, he says as follows: Pirush 
and this is not translated, I apologize, but we'll translate as we go. Pirush eruim lenevoa. The explanation is that they're in theory fitting to be prophets. Jews can be uh, prophets, and non-Jews we know can also be prophets, but Jews are much more likely to be prophets. Not that everyone can or will be, but they're in, the, in that category of a, of a people that is fit for prophecy, vim can, eno rachok shye mechuvanim, esu mechavnim, bedevar ze al haemet, beruch hakodesh, derech hakrai. So it's not, it's not far-fetched to say that they would come up uh, with the truth through Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is a level less than prophecy, but uh, they would be inspired by some sort of connection with God. He says, uh, on an occasional basis. And this is exactly what happened. This is exactly what happened, that they uh, intuited the truth from, on their own. That's very interesting. This last phrase, the Kivno Ayemet Me'alehem, the Ben is saying a little different. I don't think it's, it's so important for the rest of the presentation, but a little different than what I was saying. He's saying, as far as I read it, that they, in fact, uh, decided on their own what to do. And we'll see that this idea uh, certainly is, an, uh, is something that ends up being understood by many as what Hillel had intended, even if that wasn't, I mean, intended more generally, even if that's not the case over here, that he was looking just for people's memory, which really does not require Ruach uh, HaKodesh. I mean, the big issue and what leads the Ben Yishchai and many others in this direction is the phrase that Hillel did use. I said in, at the beginning of the, of the shiur, of the presentation, that it, in theory it could be poetic, but generally, when we look at the statements of the sages, certainly the early sages, what the people called Tanaim in, in the Talmud, we look very carefully at their words, and we assume that they're using the words very carefully, that Hillel had many other ways to say this, instead of saying that they are b'nei nevi'im, that they are the sons of prophets. Okay, how are we doing so far? Everybody with me? Any? Yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, okay, so interestingly, this phrase is somewhat ignored. I mean, we we um, we don't have a lot of writing. We have the period of the Gonim, where we have uh, not much being written. We have, of course, sort of Sadia Gaon. We have the Shil Tot. We have all, uh, we have we have we do have literature, legal and and philosophical, but it's more much more uh, scarce than in the period of the Shonim. And even the early Shonim, we don't see this phrase mentioned so much until the Rashba, uh, who is one of the early Shonim, lives in the 1200s, and a very influential voice in Halakha. So he's the first to really revive this phrase and use it in a halachic context to say that when we're not clear on what a halacha should be, I mean, when the rabbis are not clear as to the resolution of a question, one of the ways to come to a decision is to see what the people are doing, right? Just like here, by the way, we're not asking for, we don't go to the people and say, what's your opinion? We look, what, what, are, what is the practice? How are people acting? And the assumption is that people are acting in the correct way. Right, which is which is a larger topic, the whole issue of minhag of, of, of custom. But the Rashma was the first to use this phrase in saying that people have a standing in halakha, that we should listen and look carefully at what they do and what they say. Again, not saying in terms of a an argumented position, but what they say in terms of this is what I remember to be the halakha. We should listen very carefully and look very carefully, because, and he quotes this phrase, Hanach lehem, leave it to the Jews, if they're not Pnei Nevi'im, if they're not Nevi'im, if they're not prophets, they're the children of prophets. Now, I, I quoted some, some later tshuvot, because the, this issue comes out more clearly, um, the tash, uh, Tashbats, right, who's uh, of Shimon ben Semach Duran, right, is already in the, in the late 1300s, early 1400s, as well as uh, the Radbaz and the Marik in the 1400s. Uh, 
The one I didn't cite here is very important to know about because he really brought this idea into the mainstream and popularized it is of course Rav Yosef Karo, not in the Shulchan Aruch, but in the Beit Yosef. Uh, now any of you who are familiar with, uh, with the basic text of, of the Halakha, know that Rav Yosef Karo wrote two important halachic works. The first one is the Beit Yosef. The Beit Yosef is an extended commentary on the tool, the tool being the Arba Turim, which uh, preceded the Shulchan Aruch, really gave the structure of the Shulchan Aruch, Arba Turim, right, the four towers, and the four towers are the four sections that we know uh, that the Shulchan Aruch is divided in, because as I said, the, the, for, the format and the structure came from this other book. But before writing the Shulchan Aruch, the uh, of Yosef Cairo, uh, as I said, comments extensively on it, and oftentimes disagrees with the Balatuim. The Balatuim, by the way, is the son of Rabbeinu Asher, Rabbeinu Asher, known also as the Rosh, and he is one of the great poskim of this time period, of the, of the period of the Rishonim, before, before uh, the, the, the code, before the tour on the Shulchan Aruch. In any case, uh, so obviously the son is going to often side, generally side with the father. Uh, the father, Rabbeinu Asher, was a rabbi who lived in Spain, but was Ashkenazi. And he followed the traditions of the Ashkenazim, uh, generally following the approach of the Tosafot. The Tosafot is a very good uh, approach to the Gemara, but it's not the only opinion. And when everybody agrees, it's, it's fine. There's nothing to talk about. But when there's a disagreement, so the, the other people who are likely to disagree are going to be those who are coming from a different tradition, from the tradition of Svarad, of the, of the, of the Svaradim. And uh, primarily, those are going to be the Rif and the Rambam. So these, uh, what uh, the Beit Yosef did was, he said, you know, I'll give that the Rash, the Ben Asher is an important posek, but I think we, he's only one of three great poskim, and we should look at the best two out of three. I mean, it's, I'm simplifying. He has all sorts of other rules. He looks at other opinions, but essentially tip the scales more towards the Sfaradi tradition, which is why uh, Rav Moshe Israelis wrote a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch saying well, Ashkenazim do things differently in many cases. In any, in any event, I'm sure m most of this is, is well known to, to most of you, in any case, uh, the, the Beit Yosef quotes this phrase of uh, nevi'im bnei nevi'im, at least nine times that, that I found in his commentary, uh, which in a long word, it's not that often, but it's often enough that people notice that if, if the Beit Yosef or Yosef Cairo uh, thinks that this is important enough to quote this repeatedly, it must be a very serious, uh, a serious idea. And so uh, the, the people who bridge from, uh, from the Rashba, the first of the Rishonim that I know, that I'm aware of, that use this, uh, this idea to the time of the Shulchan Aruch popularized it. So these are some of the sources that you're seeing here. Um, the Tashbat, uh, we're sort of short of time, so I'm not going to go inside, uh, read it inside to you. I encourage you to, uh, to you, know, you have it and, and to, to uh, copy the source sheet, make sure you, you have it so that when the Zoom ends, you don't, uh, you don't lose it. Um, if, if anyone does, I, either for the office of the Chabura or, or myself can be contacted and you can get it. But uh, best is you don't have to do that. In any case, the, the first, uh, the first, uh, uh, shoot the first uh, response that's quoted is the Tashbats, and uh, he, the case that he's dealing with is a chet, a chet that uh, doesn't look like it. That doesn't look like it. Again, we, we, I'm not interested in the details of the halacha in this particular presentation. The point is that there was a, a doubtful chet that they saw more than once, and up to now, <clears throat> people had had accepted that form even though it was in the standard form as a proper chet. Um, and the question was, perhaps, in fact, it's not. 
So what should we do? So the uh, Tashmats gives a whole discussion of it. And in the end, you can see, uh, <coughs> again, you see, I, I cut out most of the tshuva. If you look at the tshuva, in the second to last line, the end, he says one important reason, it's not the only reason, but one important reason to simply leave the practice alone. He says, eh, lahem raya bize, right, that's, that's the end of the previous thing. Then he goes on and says, and I can't deal with this any longer. But in any case, he cites this as a reason for the halacha. That again, it's it's not simply a, a poetic phrase that has no real import in the tshuva, but he's saying that there are several reasons, one of which is that's what Jews do. And he uses this phrase that Jews are people that we should listen to because they have this spiritual pedigree of being b'nei nevi'im. And that somehow, we'll see more as we go on, somehow this, this gives them a right, or not a right as much as a credibility that we have to pay attention to what they say. The Radbaz, the next case, um, deals with a, a new technology of mugmar. Mugmar is uh, incense. Incense was normally, um, in many places still is, um, fired up uh, with coals or what have you. Uh, and this, this was something that one could start before Shabbat and use on Shabbat. In any case, the technology had changed. And the questioner to the Radbaz wanted to know whether perhaps because the technology had changed, that therefore the halacha should also change where in the past this incense had been permissible, that perhaps now it should not be permissible. The beginning of the answer is Hanach Lehem Yisrael. What do Jews do? Right? Leave it to them. Leave it to them. If they're doing, if the Jews are using this new technology of incense, it must mean that they know what they're doing. Why? Because, and this is just a, a short version of the phrase, that you need to leave it to them because they have, again, the spiritual pedigree of being the children of Nevi'im. Okay. I um, just want to make sure. I don't see any questions. Are there any questions here? No. Okay, I don't see anything. Oh, there's one thing on the chat. One second. Uh... Right, yeah, good question. Okay, um, so Avi asking an important question and I'm gonna ask Avi and everybody else to uh, make sure I answer it by the end of the shiur, okay? Um, because it, it's it's a very good question. It's, it's it, I think it's uh, an obvious one um, and should be answered. Okay, the Marik deals with a, an, a different issue, something that some people feel very strongly about, other people really dislike, and that's the practice of, <clears throat> of auctioning out aliyot, right? In the synagogue, ostensibly, it's a, you're doing business, right? Um, and, and I mean, obviously, the, the reasons say it's not a problem, but, but uh, for, for our intensive purposes, What's, what's important, the Marik also living, right, in the 1400s, this is before the Beit Yosef, also uses this phrase that if this is what Jews are doing, must be right, because um, in the middle, it's not highlighted, but imenam nevi'im, b'nei nevi'im hem. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this, this way of understanding this phrase, I'm skipping almost 500 years, uh, but this type of phrase is used in similar ways throughout the centuries after the Beit Yosef, as I said, more frequently because of his influence. Uh, two more recent post schemes that we're all familiar, familiar with also use this phrase uh, more than once, certainly in terms of uh, Chama Vad Yosef, uh, and he uses it several times. I'm not sure if Rav Kook uses it more than once in this, in a halachic context, but I know he, he does, he uses the idea quite frequently. Um, in 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 uh, in his philosophy more generally, and not only and specifically in halacha. In any case, here I have a translation for you. Uh, he's talking about photography, right? Whether it's appropriate to 
uh, photograph people? Is it a graven image, right? Uh, right. We know that certainly making a statue of a person is, is a problem. What about a photograph, right? Incidentally, you know, it, it's interesting now that we have a technology that, that turns pictures into a third dimension. I, I haven't seen that addressed by, by Puskin, but I wonder if, if, that, if anyone has thought that that might be a problem. Be that as it may, in his time, there certainly were some people who felt it was a problem. And uh, it could be that even today, I, I know, you know, 30 years ago, uh, the famous pictures of, of Hasidim trying to make sure no one photographed them. Uh, all the more so was this a, a debate in the time of Rav, uh, Rav Kook. Rav Kook is writing this, I believe, in the 1920s. Uh, one of, uh, some, something that not everybody knows about Rav Kook was he was a, a very accomplished posek halacha, right? This expertise was not only in Jewish thought and poetry and all the other things that he excelled in, but also, uh, and perhaps even primarily, in halacha. So, um, so here he, he says, well, how do I know it's right that's okay to, to, uh, take, to take photographs? And again, I'm going to read in the Hebrew and, and let you, if you're not fluent in the Hebrew, to look in the English. So I'll translate as I go along as well. He says, It's true, there are some chasidim. He's not talking about necessarily about uh, what we call Hasidim, but that's why it translates pious people who do not want to be photographed. Nonetheless, he says, it's not just a fluff, it's not just a being from, as they say, for no reason. They have a, sources in the halakha that would support their position. Says, However, Shulchan Aruch says otherwise. Obviously, the, the Shulchan Aruch didn't speak about photography, right? Uh, presumably, the Shulchan Aruch was speaking about drawing. Uh, but in any case, he continues. He says that the, the custom has spread even among those that use the term Haredi, which become a more loaded term in our times. But he means those are very serious about the halacha. Those are tremble before the word of God. It's already been said, kol halacha biyadecha. Any law that is unclear in your hand. This is, by the way, a different quote that he's referring to. Uh, now who can right, see what the people are doing and do what they do. Now, that, as it says, is a different source. It's not as powerful as the source that we've been looking at so far um, because it doesn't really give the basis for it. But then he brings this other phrase that we've been looking at all, all along. And he brings this as well. Right, the source, the next source, the Yaume of, of Chamavad Yosef, is very similar, but even more powerful. There the discussion is one of, and this is a famous halachic question that uh, some of you might be familiar with, the question of whether Jews can transgress the Shabbat to treat non-Jews on Shabbat. And that is uh, not at all clear from the Gemara that, that, that they can, meaning the, the default understanding of the Gemara and the post scheme and uh, you know the Rishonim, the, the decisors, the early decisors, the late decisors, is that they cannot. That it, it, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a longer discussion why that is, whether it should be, but on a, on a purely legal level, the simple understanding of the halacha is that doctors are not allowed to do this. However, we know that in fact doctors do do this. Uh, that has come about partly because the situation has changed. That uh, you know, modern medicine expects its doctors to treat everyone. And so the question is, what do we do? Uh, so there's another Chacham Ovadia, whose name was uh, Chacham Ovadia Hadai, also a great uh, Torah scholar. He wrote a, a book of, of Halakha, of uh, Teshuvot, of responsa called Yaskil Avdi. 
So Rehavah Ben Yosef, who any of you are familiar with, quotes all sorts of sources. So he mentions him as well. And I'm looking at the English here just to simplify for you. Uh, he says he was asked about lying Jewish doctors to desecrate the Shabbat, etc., as we said. And this rabbi said, no, he decided to forbid it. He told the, the doctors that asked him, no, you can't, can, you can't do it. And he concluded by saying, even though in truth, even the most observant doctors are lenient about this, right? He also uses the word charedi. He says, in fact, they, they, we know that people do it. Um, so he says, no, and that's a problem. They shouldn't do it. It's because this generation doesn't listen to its rabbis. So up to this is the quote from Rav Vadia Hadaya. Uh, but Rav Vadia Yosef continues and says, but not everybody agrees with this. For example, Rav Shlomo Zal, Shlomo, that should be Rav Shlomo, Zalman Arbach permits it. And then he has a lot more to say. He says, but in the fact that they do do this, the fact that religious Jews do this practice, we should listen to what they're saying. We should pay careful attention that even though they're not prophets, they're the children of prophets. Now, the reason I say this is a more powerful source than the previous sources, and it's only an example. There are other poskim who use this phrase in, in a similar way. Um, not that there's nothing else to rely on, but the default of this discussion is really, as, as I said before, the default is that the halacha is fairly clear, that you cannot do this. And Ravad Yosef says, well, there, there's, there's room to be lenient. And one of the reasons is because the Jewish people do it. One could say, as, as Chacham uh, Ovadia Hadaya exactly says, so what? Right? I think this is implicit in the question that was asked. You know, Jews can do a lot of things. That mean anything they do is automatically permissible. So the answer to that, and we'll try to speak about it more in detail, is that clearly not. But nonetheless, what Ham Vad Yosef is saying, and many others say in other cases, is that there is tremendous weight, and it's not simply a situation where it's even Stephen, as most of the cases we had before. I'm not sure which way to go, right? As uh, Ruf Cook said in the previous one, right, where you don't know. You're unclear which way to go. It can be one way or the other. So what's going to be the tiebreaker? The tiebreaker is going to be what people do. That's not what's going on in this halakha. The, 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 the default is against what the people do. Nonetheless, the, the practice of the people is strong enough to move it from asul to muta. Perhaps not of, in and of itself. Had there been no other support for it, maybe he wouldn't have done that. Nonetheless, it's a criteria in moving it from asul to muta. By the way, it could, it could go the other way also. This is a lenient teshuva. It's not really the point. It could be a, a, in the case that it's a stringent teshuva that would also be presumably the same thing. Now, this next source is very, very interesting, and I want to go back to it, but I'm first going to skip it. This is one of the students of, uh, of the Vilna Gaon explaining the idea uh, more philosophically, but I want to skip it and get back to it at the end. Uh, there's a Mishnah and Pirkei Avot. Well, before I get to the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot, so uh, there's a similar phrase to this that was coined. Uh, I, I'm not sure if he was the first one. The first one I could track who coined this phrase was the Abalbanel, Don Yitzchak Abalbanel. The phrase being Kol uh, Hamon Kekol Shaddai, right? In fact, if you look in Midrash Shmuel, right, um, it's the, the last four words, Kol Hamon Kekol Shaddai, which means the voice of the masses is like the voice of God. Now, this is a very interesting phrase because it's, uh, it's really ba ba borrowed from the non-Jews, right? The very top, no, you don't have it actually. Yeah, you do. Vox populi, uh, vox dei, which means in Latin, and I don't know if I pronounced that completely correct, but uh, the, the, uh, the meaning of this phrase in Latin is that the voice of the people is the voice of God, right? Kol hamon, kol shaddai. 
And uh, the Abarbanel borrowed this. The, the non-Jews were using this phrase uh, both positively and negatively for several hundred years before the Abarbanel. Some people saying it's true, some people arguing with it. Uh, it became even more popular uh, in England, among other places, uh, as the nations were giving, taking more power from the monarchy and from the aristocracy and, and dividing power to, to the estates and then to the, to the people. So this, uh, this phrase has an interesting place in, in secular history. In any case, the Barbanel, who I'm sure many of you know, was involved, very involved in the secular world as a minister um, and had all sorts of, of different positions in, in a variety of countries, first in Spain, obviously, and uh, involved in the Spanish exile and took uh, refuge in various uh, countries in Italy and then Turkey. But, uh, but in any case, he, he, uh, he brought this phrase, which actually it has two roots. One of the roots I mentioned in the secular world, and it wasn't secular, the, the Christian world, really. And the other root is what we mentioned at the beginning, the Gemara Psachim. And as the Gemara Psachim phrased it differently, uh, that call, uh, we say, Imenam uh, Nevim Bnei Nevim Hem, the phrase call, Hamon Kol Shaddai, is sort of dovetails on that on that idea and that phrase, even though it's interesting, the barber himself used it in a less in a weaker fashion, more in the way we suggested originally that Hillel was just being poetic, and it's a question of crowdsourcing, which is a whole interesting discussion. The 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 notion of crowdsourcing that when you ask a lot of people. Uh, what they think about a certain thing that does not necessarily require a, a extreme expertise, that they end up being more correct uh, on the whole than a small group of experts, certainly than individual experts. In any case, that's the way the Barbanel understood this phrase. And he applied it to Avot, but as time went on, very shortly thereafter, uh, Shmuel, Uzi, uh, Shmuel Uzida, it took this phrase even further in the direction that we're speaking about, this phrase of kol hamon, kol shaddai, and brings it to a place where it really dovetails the idea we've been speaking about throughout the presentation. He brings it on, on Pirkei Avot, in the same Mishnah that the Barbanel brings it. The Mishnah, uh, you can see in the source sheet, is in the third. Uh, third chapter, and there Rav Hanina ben Dosa says, "Kol sheruach habriot no haimenu ruach makom no haimenu kol she en ruach habriot no haimenu en ruach hamakom no haimenu," which means that when uh, a person is liked by people, he's liked by God. When a person is not liked by people, he's not like not liked by God, right? So. Obviously, one has to understand the, the context and what is, is meant here, but the Midrash Shmuel explains as follows, to, to, to let us understand that the group, the aggregate, is a true aggregate, Le'olam. He says, always, right? This is, a, this is different than Ben Yishchai, who speaks about occasional. He says, no. The Klal, and we have to go back uh, in a minute and, and Try to define well who is the klal, uh, but before we do that, he says, uh, the person who the aggregate of people derive pleasure from can only be certainly a completely righteous person. Why else would everybody like such a person? His inside is like his outside. Right, because oftentimes one sees someone who appears righteous but is not. How do you? How can you tell if they're sincere and really are what they appear to be? See what the people think. If everybody likes him, that must mean that uh, his inside is like his outside. And God is going to agree with that judgment. Why he call Hamon ke kol shakai? 
that the voice of the people is just like the voice of God. It works in the same way. Now, um, I mentioned before, a couple of minutes ago, that one has to address who is the cloud, right? Is it all the Jewish people? So perhaps at one time it was, but one assumes that we're talking about the committed Jewish people, meaning that those that are committed to halakha, it's a longer discussion why uh, we can't necessarily include those who aren't. Certainly it's obvious in terms of halakha, if people don't care about halakha, then why should we assume that they are going to be doing what's correct and not simply what they want to do, what's easier for them? And there's, there's a discussion in the academic discussions about, uh, about crowdsourcing and, and you know, that there are various conditions that are required in order for it to work. One of them is obviously sincerity, right? Meaning if you ask a bunch of people, uh, what stock do you think is most most prone to go up in the next six months? And you ask, you know, a bunch of people who who own a certain stock, and they say, well, of course, our stock, right? So obviously, there's a bias. There's a bias. It's uh, one. Yeah, I mean, ideally, they would be also honest about it, but one has to suspect that they're not. So when you have such a situation of people who are not committed and have ulterior motives, so then that is not what we're speaking about when we're talking about the claw. But barring such a situation, then yes, everybody else is included. In the modern period, we already saw the Chamavad Yosef and, and Rav Kook. Um, in the modern period, this idea, which we, we've seen up to now primarily, except for this last source in, in the Midrash Shmuel. By the way, I can't resist telling you that this phrase, kol hamon kol shadai, there's something similar. I mean, the Barbanel was playing with the Pasuk, but the Pasuk doesn't say this and doesn't mean anything like this. I don't remember the exact phrase in the Pasuk, but uh, it, it became, this phrase became popular enough that uh, at least two uh, different Sifre Kodesh, different writers subsequent to, uh, to the Midrash Shmuel and to the Barbanel wrote uh, a certain idea, Shenema, Kol Hamon Kekol Shakai, meaning as it says in scripture, Kol Hamon Kekol sh kol Shakai, kol shadai, which is in fact uh, incorrect. But in any event, the, what I was saying to you before is that in the modern period, in pre-modern period, this idea of the wisdom of the people sort of dovetails the move to popular uh, elections, popular power, popular responsibility. And one of the movements that within Judaism very much uh, uh, endorsed endorsed the the notion that the people the commoners um, have much more wisdom and are much more valuable than we had given them to be up until this point is is uh, is the Hasidim, and in fact you find in in a uh, in great deal of Has Hasidic literature this phrase brought over in halacha and in hashkafa as well. Um, so here you have a quote from the Preet Tzaddik, with Tzaddik Cohen, right, who, uh, who here speaks about practice, but a, in other place he speaks about uh, what they do as well. And this idea is not limited of, of bringing into the Hashkafa, into the way we look at what is true, what is right, is not limited to the Hasidim but also it took its place among other great thinkers. Some of you might have heard of Ramosha Amiel. Ramosha Amiel was a rabbi in Belgium, but even more importantly became the, uh, I think it was the first chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. I, I don't know if, if there was someone before him. Um, could be there was. He was, he was, he was in the 30s. In the 30s, he was uh, elected chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. 
very interesting rabbi. And uh, on quite a few occasions in his writings, he writes about the wisdom of the people. And again, not simply limited to halakha. Here we have a quote uh, regarding uh, Hanukkah. Now, something many of us are unaware of is that Hanukkah is, I mean, we all know that it's a minor holiday, but that being said, it's it's sort of had a great fortune on, on two levels. Number one, in the diaspora, it comes out at the same time or close to the same time as Christmas. And uh, because of that, the Jews want to have some share in the festivities. So they have their own miniature Christmas. That's, that's one uh, impetus. But the more important impetus and the one that Rev Amiel is speaking about is in Eretz Israel. In, I mean, he's talking about in, in the 30s and 40s before Israel is a, is a country. But even at that time, the story of Hanukkah very much found resonance with the Zionists because it's a, it's a story of, of Jewish power, it's a story of Jewish rebellion against their overlords. And this is precisely what's going on in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, where they are under the uh, the regime of the British who are preventing them at this point, and certainly in the 30s, uh, with the various white papers, are preventing the Jews from their own state, from independence, from bringing more Jews to, uh, to, to, to I mean, in the, in, the in the late 30s and 40s, uh, tragically so, and, and trapping them in Nazi Europe. But uh, as far as the, you know, the main issue, as far as the Zionists and, and the British was concerned, is whether there would be enough Jews to create a Jewish state. In any case, the Hanukkah story was something that, as I said, had resonance for, uh, the, for these Jews. And among religious Jews, certainly the non-Zionist religious Jews, this was seen as artificial, which on some level it was. In other words, Hanukkah had not been celebrated as a, as a major holiday and, and come along Zionists, particularly those less committed to Torah, and uh, made great, great deal out of Hanukkah, right? Great celebration, et cetera, et cetera. And Rev. Amiel said, no, we should be listening to them. We should be listening to their sense that perhaps today, granted in the past Hanukkah, had not been so important, but perhaps today the idea that it represents merits greater emphasis. And he speaks about, and it, generally, when, when Rav Amiel uses this phrase, he's speaking about generally non or less religious Jews, which is interesting because what we said before in the halacha is that when we're speaking about the klal that we should listen to, we should be speaking to, we should be listening to the religious Jews because they're committed, they're going to be sincere. So Rav Amiel says that that may be true concerning halacha, strictly speaking, but when it's concerning things that are germane, that are relevant to the Jewish people as a whole, then we should really be listening to the Jewish people as a whole, because here, on such issues, there's no bias. It's not that they're looking for convenience. They're simply intuiting what the what history is saying and what their own spirits right going back to the benishchai right what their ruach kodesh what the spiritual connection to god is telling them to do and so he says if they're not prophets right the phrase we've we've all, we've seen all throughout they're the children of prophets and they sometimes feel <clears throat> with an instinctive feeling more than that which is possible for the sages to grasp through their wisdom. Says Rav Amiel, the rabbis are not always right. The people sometimes know better. And that's exactly the story that we had with Hillel to begin with. I want to get through two more sources. And then if there's any questions, I'll open it up. And I will try to get to the question that's on the chat <clears throat> before opening up as well. So the going back to the source that we skipped, the beautiful explanation, of the spiritual content of this idea. Again, this in itself could be <clears throat> an hour's presentation, 
uh, Rav Eliel Rogler, a student of Rav Chaim Velozhner, right, who as I, I said before, he was a, a student of the Gra, of the Gaon Vilna, so that's not correct. The Rav Chaim Velozhner is a student of the Gra, and he's a student of Rav Chaim Velozhner, so it's two generations away. In any case, he says as follows, I'm reading in the English, that which the practice, that which the practice agreed upon among all of Israel, this is Klal Yisrael, is according to the Holy Spirit. This comes from Ruach HaKodesh. We've seen this phrase before. The reason it's used is we, when we're saying B'nai Nevi'im, no one's claiming that there's actual prophecy going on. But there is something metaphysical, something beyond just rational understanding. Uh, <clears throat> so he says such that God may be blessed appears among them. They actually practice as from the mouth of the prophet. Again, not from the mouth, but as if as on account of their will and action for the sake of heaven, God gives all of Israel the Holy Spirit, Rach HaKodesh, again, as how to practice, right? Because they want to do what, what's right, and they're connected spiritually to this tradition of association with God, that they, they're given some sort of holy intuition. And then he says, and there's proof about this from Sachim, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's what we've seen before. Finally, Rav Moshe Feinstein, a, a beautiful interview he had in the New York Times, uh, which relates to this as well. How does a rabbi in our day become a great rabbi? That's what was asked of Moshe Feinstein, right? This little man uh, living very humbly on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Why do so many people come to him? He didn't have an official position. I mean, he was the Rosh Shiva, a very small yeshiva that he set up. Why do so many people come to him? And he says as follows, if people see that one answer is good, another answer is good, gradually you'll be accepted. So this too is along the lines of what we've been saying up until now. Okay, so I just want to, end, before I open it up to, to questions more generally, I want to answer the, uh, the uh, obvious question. Right? I'll, I'll just read it again. Um, uh, so what are the parameters of this concept? Jews start worshiping idols. Surely you wouldn't say B'nai Nivim. We can't always apply this concept. So, as I said before, that's certainly the case that we can't always uh, apply this concept, and that's why there's a sort of balance of powers. Meaning, what we've seen so far is rabbis saying, "Yes, the people are right," and it needs to to have this sort of approval by rabbis who are uh, sort of watching and seeing what are they saying, what are they talking about. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the notion of crowdsourcing, I said there, there, there are certain limitations to it. One, one I stressed about the bias of some people who are not sincere, but I also mentioned more in passing that uh, there are certain areas where crowdsourcing doesn't work. Right? You can't crowdsource how to create an atomic bomb. Uh, it's simply not going to happen. Right? There are certain issues that simply... Uh, require expertise. Other things, in terms of the, the, the example that Avi gave, that what about idol worship? So that's what we said before. Uh, certainly when it comes to halakha, we're looking at people that are committed to the system, right? People committed to the system are certainly not going to start worshiping idols. And if they do, they automatically become excluded. Um, I have more to say, but if there are questions, I'll, I'll take questions. You can either just speak up or, or write on the chat. Any questions? No questions, feel free to unmute, raise your hands. Um, I'll say it seems like the, the, this concept of banana veem is, 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 is is relegated to a very specific case of we don't remember the halakha. So we can rely on people to sort of what do you remember the halakha to be? Which is, that's why it's like b'nai navi, meaning the original generation had the answer. They were the navi, they saw the answer clearly. Then, okay, they're at least they're the son of the navi. They can sort of recall. And then ultimately though, there, there is also seemingly like a the kublani, like, oh yeah, I remember, you know, like that, that's actually what brings it into the halakha. Um, the, a lot of the other applications, like we saw uh, by, you know, hashkafa or by even elections or by all these things, it seems to be like a misusage of that concept. It, that's just the idea of, of mass consent or like, 
you know, how what the reality is on the ground. You know, it's, it's not, we don't run in a vacuum. So you want to see what people, how are they feeling? But it seems like it's two separate concepts. Right. So, so it's interesting. I, I said at the beginning, that is a way that the, the source could be understood, that it's simply a question of memory. And I, and I appreciate your uh, nuance in terms of the, the idea of Bnevi'im, it's, it's like one generation apart, a question of memory. But what we've seen, and, and this is interesting, um, a lot of tradition is based on how people understood the source. So it could be that you have a more correct understanding of the source of the Gemara Psachim than our tradition does. But our tradition understood it a different way. I mean, I, I'm 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 more sympathetic to the way the tradition understood. I think there's as as profound profundity to how it's been understood, but it's certainly not the only way to to understand the idea. And as, as far as the the later sources, I, I think again, and as we progress historically, there's more and more of a sense, <clears throat> and again, this dovetails uh, general history. There's more and more of a sense that people have wisdom, that there's wisdom to the crowd. It's not simply checking what's acceptable as much, and particularly in the Jewish context, is saying that there's a spiritual dimension and that the phrase nevi'im is not accidental, but very purposeful. And that's why you see the phrase ruach ha-kodesh used so frequently by the various sources that we saw. Again, avoiding the phrase nevuah, because clearly we're not dealing with, with prophecy per se, but nevertheless seeing a metaphysical aspect to this, that it's not simply um, a, a question of haphazard. And, you know, again, as, as the standard understanding of crowdsourcing is that people as a whole tend to do the right thing. Um, <clears throat> though, I, I mentioned the Barbanel interested Kolamon Shaddai that way. And nonetheless, the general picture that we get is something that there's something metaphysical going on, that there's a Ruach HaKodesh, that there's an interaction between God and the community. And that's why they, the, the community has the force of influencing the Alaha, uh, reflected and ref uh, uh, reflected through the lens of the rabbis who have the knowledge to know when and how to absorb these opinions. Yeah. Okay, I think we're uh, out of time. But yeah, there's a hand up. Uh, um, thank you for, for the presentation and, and also addressing the question I asked earlier. Um, if I may, I'd like to just um, challenge the idea in a way, but it's um, because I see how that this term could be this concept could be used in a way that can justify so much um and i i'd like to sort of try maybe if we can define a little bit more the the application of it um and i i think the first thing is you know this idea of you, you know you mentioned it's it's in the gemara here and there and the concept of pukhazi go see what people are doing um even you know you mentioned Rav, Rav Vadia says it and but at the end of the day, it's still hardly used um, if you look at the big picture. And um, I think the fact that it's used once or twice, okay, but it's it's really not a typical uh, legal concept. Um, so I'm trying to sort of you know understand when when it where you know where to draw the line really. Um, maybe you could sort of I know you addressed it, but I'd like to sort of if you could. Uh, yeah, no, sure, I appreciate that. And, and I think that we've seen through. Most of the sources, certainly in halakha, what we're dealing with is when there is some sort of doubt. Clearly, that's what we be, we began with with Hilal, that there's a doubt. In other words, if the halakha is clear to the rabbis, they're not going to look to what the people to say to determine what the halakha. They already know what the halakha is. So when it comes to halakha, I think that's clear. I think when you have in, in the later <clears throat> sources that we have. Uh, Rav Amiel, in particular, you have this in Rav Kook also, by the way, in sources that I didn't bring, is that there is a time where we see that there's wisdom, if not in halacha, at least in hashkafa, to the Jewish people that the rabbis should be listening to. Again, when 
I think your, your question is, is correct. It, it's, it's really murky as far as when do we apply that? When don't we apply that? And that's why I'm saying that the, the rabbis have a role. We need a Rav Amiel, we need a Rav Kook to say, you know, this is correct and this is not correct. But the, their point is that it's not coming from me. It's coming from the Jewish people. But I think in terms of strict halacha, which you're talking about uh, the various chuvot that we've seen, even in Chacham Avad Yosef, ultimately we're dealing with a, a sheila that's that's open. It's an open question, and there's a doubt. <clears throat> um, and this is a, one variable, right? If there's many, many variables going against it, generally the posek will not choose in the in this favor. But it is a variable that one looks to in it. And I think that, um, granted, it's, you're right, it's not every halacha, precisely for the reason that I mentioned, generally the, the halachot are uh, more clear one way or the other. But it is, I think, if you, if you look through the literature, you'd be surprised at how frequently it does come up. Uh, I think we have a question from Neil. I'm wondering whether we're talking about it metaphysically. Are we talking about, say, from a platonic point of view, an intuition of the good? which is within the people who are religious, they're going to have a connection with this metaphysical concept from, which I think is partly derived from Plato's philosophy originally, which I think came into Judaism. Yeah, so I, I don't know the, the derivation. I mean, again, it, you have the, the, the original concept already in the Gemara, whether that's how it was meant originally or not, as we yeah. said, is unclear. Um, but certainly, we're, we're dealing with a with a metaphysical concept that, yeah. Whether it's whether it's in uh, in fact, uh, I, I can't tell you. May you may know better than I. I, I don't. <laughs> but 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 certainly, we, 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 I, I think again. The 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 I think that there should be a distinction between those who bring this concept strictly in halacha without any sort of uh, explanation for it and those who attempt to explain it. And I think we've seen both types of sources. You know, we saw the, the uh, Ben Ishchai, we saw this uh, Rav Eliyahu Rogler, we saw Rav, um, uh, Rav, um, uh, Rav Amiel, and I mean, there are other sources that are not on the sheet, but we, there, there's a distinction between those who are taking a cut and dry uh, usage of this term, there's a doubt in halacha, and the fact that there's a metaphysical uh, power makes us listen to them and those who actually go and explain that, uh, that concept and you know, re really spell it out for us. Yeah, thanks. I just noticed that I have the wrong name on my, uh, my picture. But, uh, <laughs> I think everybody figured it out. And it's, it's interesting just to, I don't know if anyone would use it, Meaning, even in a case of suffix, if it, if it act according to those who explain it metaphysically, like there's this, um, you know, it's almost like a a type of nevua, then it it, it, com it comes into the issue of nevua and halakha. Right, right. That's, that's and, you know, and halakha, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, 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 I, I never thought of that, and I appreciate that point, right? That we know that uh, nevua doesn't have a role in halakha. And we say we know. Um, in fact, it's not as clear cut as we often think. Uh, Chama Vadi Yosef was very strong on that, uh, as he wasn't the only one. Uh, the, the, the famous case that this is discussed in is Shelot Chuvot Min uh, It's one of the Rishonim who wrote a book uh, of Halakha, a book that, that's actually very well grounded on uh, halachically speaking. But his claim was that he received his answers in dreams from God, right? And we know that the famous uh, Gemara of Tanur uh, Shlachnai, where the rabbis say, you know, the, the halacha is for the rabbis to decide based on rational arguments, it has nothing to do with, with prophecy. Prophecy is one thing, and halacha is another. So, granted, um, it's uh, Nivua is not merely uh, limited to nivua in this case. In other words, the fact that they do something is inspired 
it doesn't automatically, and I, I think no one's saying that it automatically turns it into halakha. Again, there's a process, and that's a, I, I perhaps I haven't emphasized that clearly enough, that there's a process, a, a, a checks and balances that the rabbi and, peop, and the people work together, and ultimately the, the ultimate decision maker is, it, are, are the rabbis and, and not the people. The people are simply a, 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 a factor that the rabbis need to listen to, again, in specific cases where there's a doubt. I said there was another question or his comment. And the question is adding the, the dollar. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we see, we see interestingly, I don't wanna to take too much time, but just this topic is so fascinating. Um, we see like, uh, for example, Harambam make use of this concept of sort of mass consent, which is interesting because no one usually assumes that uh, Harambam makes use of that. But like, for example, his, his, reason, his, his reasoning why we accept the Talmud is because the masses of the people accepted it as compelling and that's why we use it. Or for example, when he says, how can we rebuild the Sanhedrin if most of the Chachamim accept one person, which is like this idea of consent from the, or like a, a mass uh, voting from the Chachamim. Um, he also says this in, in, uh, by uh, the acceptance of the Navi. He says it's not enough just to have signs. It has to have acceptance of the masses of the people. Right. He just doesn't right. cause, call it this term of the Navi. Right. He just says that underlying every legal system and every political system is this idea of mass consent and that they just create the reality. So it's interesting that I think he's he's using that concept without mislabeling it as the Navi. <laughs> right, right. I would say it's a different conception of yeah. the law of, of the people, but yeah. And uh, to Avi's question, the, the uh, synagogue in my background, I mean, it's, it's, it's a picture, it's not a real, a real thing, but it's uh, the Hempstead Synagogue in, in London, the Hempstead Shul. So that, that's my host for the weekend. And uh, the, 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 the Rabbi Michael Harris, who you see instead of my name, is the rabbi and uh, he's sponsoring my Zoom chair and, and my computer this <laughs> evening. I'm based in Jerusalem, as I think uh, some of you know, and uh, though I'm, I'm here on the weekend, London, flying back uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all. I wish you all continued success. Seems like a really nice thing that you all are doing, and uh, you should continue having Hatzlacha. Thank you so much, Rahman. Thank you so much for this very insightful shiur. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, stay tuned. We have tomorrow, we have uh, Shiur on Kashrut principles with Rabbi uh, Amrum Nemeth. And on Wednesday, we have Rabbi Simi Lerner on Rav Hirsch in conversation with Rambam. So, very exciting week ahead of us. Uh, Laila Tov, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you.